I'm standing in a field of cannabis. Now, we normally think of marijuana as a recreational drug, but there's only one molecule in cannabis that makes you high. There are actually more than 100 other different and interesting chemical substances in these plants. And they offer huge medical potential because they might be able to tap into one of the body's natural systems. One that runs on its own cannabis-like molecules and is key. It is involved in memory, it is involved in epilepsy, it is involved in schizophrenia, it is involved in a huge, huge number of human diseases. Understanding the medicinal properties of these cannabis compounds has been a long time coming. It is extremely difficult to initiate a clinical trial with an illicit drug. While the science may be scant, the community has already taken it up. It's been four and a half years on the medicinal cannabis and for us it's been a huge change and yeah, I don't think you'd still be here, I really don't. Now, researchers are applying scientific rigour to convert anecdote into data so we might fully and safely harness the medicinal power of cannabis. It's a very exciting time at the moment in the world of medicinal cannabis. Freedom! Cannabis isn't just one drug. There's potentially 200 drugs or, or more. Cannabis is a versatile plant, also known as hemp, marijuana and weed. It's been used throughout history as a fibre, an intoxicant, and a medicine. For millennia, plants were essentially the only source of drugs. We have actually written data by Assyrians in the Middle East that they used cannabis for neurological diseases 3,000 years ago. The wide use of cannabis as a drug was in India, in China, and the Middle East for thousands of years. Queen Victoria used cannabis tinctures for her period pain, so she was actually an enthusiast to enjoy the analgesic effects. And really, what you see is that the extracts were very widely used for all sorts of different conditions. By the time the 20th century rolled in, cannabis had acquired a very different image. It was seen as a drug of abuse and made illegal. And as a result, there was much less focus on its medicinal properties. was taken up by counterculture youth through the decades and cannabis got a bad name. Cannabis just joins the list as another traditional bad drug that turns out may have remarkable therapeutic effects. That therapeutic potency is found in the plant's active chemicals. They're called cannabinoids. Well, there's an awful lot of them and they, they have terribly long names and so we abbreviate them into things like CBD for cannabidiol, we've got a CBC, we've got a CBN. It's like a really bad scrabble hand. Despite their cold acronyms, out in the field the cannabinoids are quite pretty. So this was originally just a seed trial crop but it displays the same sort of thing when it flowers for the cannabinoids. Right, so what part of the plant has the cannabinoids? It's all those little crystals you can see in there. So you can see, oh yeah, yeah they're, they're all different glint shapes. In the light. Yeah, yeah, they glint in the light. The number and type of cannabinoids on a plant varies depending on what the crop was bred for. So you've got roughly about five to seven percent cannabinoids on this plant. It's a seed variety and that's what it's designed for. If this was a marijuana plant, it would be mostly, or 90%, THC. But this is so minuscule in THC, it's got room for all the other cannabinoids to exist on the plant. THC is an acronym for tetrahydrocannabinol. Of the more than 100 cannabinoids, its heady qualities have made it the most famous. THC is this bit of the cannabis plant which makes you stoned, you get a high feeling, so it is psychoactive and it also impairs your cognitive performance. Despite its mind-altering effects, THC also has potential therapeutic applications, particularly in pain reduction and appetite stimulation. Interestingly, 
The levels of THC in street cannabis have changed over the last 40 years. A couple of years ago, we did a study with the New South Wales Police. And what we found was that typical Australian street cannabis has been sort of bred or selected to produce very high quantities of THCs. Guaranteed to get you very intoxicated, even with a small amount um, consumed. What was interesting about street cannabis was that there was hardly any CBD. It's the one that is most touted as being the good medicinal cannabinoid. In yin and yang fashion, CBD, also known as cannabidiol, has the opposite effect to THC. CBD is a really interesting uh, therapeutic. It can reduce anxiety. And there's also evidence to show that it has anti-inflammatory and antioxidant uh, effects. Amazingly, it was only 30 years ago that we discovered why these cannabis compounds affect us. In the 80s, a group in the US found a receptor that THC binds to. This receptor is known today as cannabinoid receptor 1. There are two known cannabinoid receptors in the body. CB1, which is expressed abundantly in the brain, and CB2, present in the immune system. Both are found in the central nervous system. It was Professor Meshulam an early pioneer in cannabis science, who discovered that these receptors respond to our very own cannabis compounds. They're called endocannabinoids. Now, we know that receptors do not exist just because there is a plant out there. Receptors exist to be activated by uh, compounds that our body makes. There are two main endocannabinoids. There's 2-AG, which is the most common one found in the brain. There's also anandamide, which, among other places, is found in breast milk. We're still learning about the endocannabinoid system. It's so pervasive. I mean, you find cannabinoids in your testicles, and you also find them in your brain, you find them in your fat, you find them in your liver, you find them all over the body and brain. So they have this kind of multifarious um, role, which is hard to pin down. The endocannabinoid system, in very general terms within the brain, acts as a regulator of excitability. So if the brain's too excited, endocannabinoids are released and through a kind of negative feedback mechanism appear to dampen down excitability. They can also do the opposite though as well. If the brain is too inhibited, they can be released and actually upregulate excitability. So they're like a buffering system. For many years, people smoked cannabis for its psychoactive effects and no one imagined that those effects were brought about through interaction with the endocannabinoid system. But it's not surprising because for the drugs to work they have to be modulating something in the brain and it turned out to be a natural cannabis system. While we've learnt quite a lot about the body's natural cannabis system, we still don't know the specifics of how the various molecules in cannabis interact with our bodies. Well, that's what they're trying to work out here at the University of Sydney. Researchers are drawing on anecdotal community experience with medicinal cannabis to learn about the much touted benefit on one specific illness, childhood epilepsy. As part of the study, I am travelling and visiting families who have a child with epilepsy, who are either currently using medicinal cannabis products, who have previously used and stopped for whatever reason, um, or those that have never used medicinal cannabis, um, but simply want to talk a bit more about it. There's a lot of community push for cannabis extracts to be developed as treatments for childhood epilepsy. Thank you. Good day. I've had my all. Look at you, man, bunning it. <laughs> Get your little top knot. Thank you. Hello. One of the participating families is LJ Elwell and her 12-year-old son, Hunter. What's going on, bro? Hunter has Drave syndrome, a rare neurodevelopmental disorder where the child suffers intractable seizures. Hence, it's a form of epilepsy. So this one here was when he was two. Um, it's just before he deteriorated quite a lot. He had a massive seizure not long after this that required him to go into ICU and be um, induced into a coma. So, yes, yeah, so that started our sort of downhill time with him. 
It's important to control the seizures so that the children don't get brain damage or don't receive any damage to the brain, which of course with Hunter resulted in a loss of a lot of skills. Standing, talking, sitting, holding his head up, feeding himself, all these things that, that children lose with repeat seizures. Despite trying every available epilepsy medication, nothing successfully controlled Hunter's seizures. This here is his fifth birthday. He was so bombed from seizures and medications that we had to wake him for these photos. And so he slept through every one of his birthdays until he was eight. <laughs> he, never, he didn't participate in any. The only, only recollection he has is the photos. <laughs> For six years, he was in and out of hospital. We spent more days and nights in hospital a year than we did at home. And then when he was seven and a half, going on to eight, we started looking at medicinal cannabis and sort of getting away from the pharmaceutical meds as much as we could. For the past four years, LJ has been treating Hunter with medicinal cannabis. Hunter's seizures, uh, they decreased within 24 hours. We saw a, a half of them drop off. So, yeah, it's a 50% drop straight away. You're in a real talkative mood. What are you jumping on? Because Hunter can't swallow, LJ gives him the drug via a gastro feeding tube. He became um, more aware of his surroundings, more responsive. He started recognising people. He started to have a bit more cognitive ability. Freedom! We're working really hard at like trying to gain back some of his skills. So he's learnt to say mum again, which he hadn't said in a long time. So that is really nice. So he says mum most days now. He'll call for me whether he's sad, upset or happy. LJ treats Hunter with an oil-based form of cannabis. She's taking part in the study because she's keen to find out exactly what's in the product. It's predominantly, well, hopefully predominantly CBD mm -hmm. and THCA, um, but I'm not too sure what else is sort of in there. I think it's exciting to see what's in everybody's uh, supply they have. I want to see why it's working, how it's working. There are some children that aren't showing any positive effect to it and others that are, so I want to know why. And the researchers are keen to know too. So they're taking LJs and other community sourced tinctures and oils to the lab to find out exactly what's in them. We're looking at ways that we can harness the power of what's already happening in the community and back translate some of the signals to the lab and learn more about the fundamental mechanisms that may be therapeutically useful with cannabis. So there's oh, THC. Gee, it's quite yellow. Yeah, in comparison to CBD, it's actually very yellow. It's the cannabis compound, CBD, that's thought to have the positive effect in epilepsy. But there are many other, so far unexplored cannabinoids that may also play a role. So there's THC and CBD. THCV, THCVA, THCA. I think of it as a treasure trove and we're not quite sure what the treasures are yet. CBL, CBLA. The ones that we don't really know a lot about yet, they're the, the ones that might be real wonder molecules. CBN, CBNA, CBNVA, um, CNA. Sorry, it's CVA. Just cut there. That was enough. Now that's a woman who knows her cannabinoids. We have some samples from the actual Pelican study. It shows predominantly two cannabinoids, as you can tell by the height of the peaks. So basically, these are cannabinoids? Yes. You know, when we looked at it broad scale, you could only see two. But when you highlight them, there are actually significant amounts of other cannabinoids. They're just kind of drowned out by how concentrated the other two are. So the, the ones that have the biggest, broadest peaks aren't necessarily the ones with the medical value. Right, so that's what we're trying to figure out. We're mm. trying to see even if some of the ones that are in low concentrations might be working at that low concentration. We've noticed that the amounts of THC in it is actually quite low. It's early days yet with the Pelican study, but we're not seeing a lot of THC, which is a good thing because we don't want these children to be intoxicated. So this means it would have a negligible psychoactive effect on Hunter. Oh, good. Good. Yeah. good <laughs> but the, the surprising thing so far is that we're not seeing a lot of CBD, and we would kind of assumed that CBD would be very prominent because there already is a fair literature on CBD having anticonvulsant effects. So that throws a spotlight on a whole bunch of more obscure cannabinoids. <laughs> 
We're starting to do work with cells and with mice to try and link some of these more novel cannabinoids to anticonvulsant effects. The researchers are using mice that have been genetically engineered to have a condition similar to Dravet syndrome, the form of epilepsy Hunter has. So they're actually quite a good model for the human condition. Oh yeah, they're an excellent model. They exhibit seizures in association with fever, spontaneous seizures, and a reduced lifespan. So we will treat the mice with the cannabinoids, and then we will induce a fever. We'll raise the mouse's body temperature. So you will give them different kinds of cannabinoids and see what effect they have on that. We're looking for the cannabinoid that is most effective at preventing the thermally induced seizures and then ultimately, eventually, the, the spontaneous seizures. And is it the case that some could work together? Oh, that's definitely the case, which is why we'll test them in combination. It's still very early days in this preclinical work, with no available data yet. But along with reducing seizures, they're hoping to also have an effect on lifespan. This is what's seen in Trave children as well. There's sudden death that can occur. Uh, it affects about 16% of, of the children. So if we can um, reduce that mortality rate, that would be a major achievement. What we're really hoping will come out of that is a novel anticonvulsant, that there's a cannabinoid that's yet to be characterised, yet to be identified that is an even better anticonvulsant than CBD is, and we're working furiously on that at the moment. That's the hope for the future. But right now, in the clinical world, the focus is still on CBD. Hi, Ian. How are you? Childhood epilepsy is a condition Professor Ingrid Sheffer treats every day. Do you have a doggy at home? She's eager for more effective therapies for her patients. So you may see a child that's tried six different anti-epileptic drugs. None of them have worked. They still have seizures every day. And we're all very desperate to try and find a drug that can control their seizures. I get asked about medicinal cannabis sometimes six times a day. Professor Sheffer is at pains to tell them that right now there's not much good evidence. We need very well-designed randomised, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials. And once we have those answers, they will tell us if medicinal cannabis is effective, and then I will be delighted to use it if it is effective, if it helps the patients. Keep as still as you can, Lockie. Finally, these gold standard clinical trials are happening, well including Lockie. here in Australia. This trial is testing that familiar cannabinoid, CBD, in adults with unresponsive epilepsy. Make sure you squeeze it all out. We want to make sure you get the whole dose. Rub it in quite hard, like really vigorously, up and down, up and down. 25-year-old Lockie Davidson is part of the trial. It's trying to get used to it is all. Yeah, yeah. It comes as a gel, rubbed into the skin twice a day, which gives a controlled release of CBD into the bloodstream. This is just a blood test to determine how much of the drug is in your bloodstream. It's important information in determining what sort of doses people will get. Good to see you. Lockie's been a patient of Professor Sheffer's since he was eight. He has an unusual brain tumour, a very rare one, called a hypothalamic hematoma. Do you just feel like you missed something, do you? In, in... Which is a benign type of tumour but it's also right deep in the clockwork in the hypothalamus of the brain. And it's classically associated with these very rare form of seizures called laughing seizures. And so the person has this mirthless laughter several times a day for Lockie. Um, but on top of that, he has more um, severe seizures where he loses awareness and he's not with it. So you're in the trial now. Tell us how it's going. It seems to be going OK, I think. What I did notice is that the seizures are lasting four to five minutes, mm -hmm. which is less than they were before, but this time he's going sound asleep. Over most of my life, I've been having seizures at least once every two, three days. There you go. Right. Glad I can teach you. <laughs> I'm not able to travel far without requiring somebody to, uh, to aid me. Unfortunately, the meds I have taken for a long time give me a problem with my grasp on words. It doesn't help because I used to be a pretty good debater 
Um, and so when I started taking a larger dose of medication, it has made me struggle with some words. You must find that very frustrating, I'm guessing. Very. You know, see, that's cheating. You look. This will be my eighth attempt at finding a medication to to control my epilepsy. So he's better at the end of it. At the it end of it, he's completely time. alert. It's wonderful. I think it's really important that we acknowledge that you've only been on the trial for two weeks. And so two weeks is nothing yet. We really can't make any judgment. And this could just be your natural history. So it's always hard to tell if a new drug makes a difference until you have a longer time to play out. And we also don't know if you're on placebo or on drug at this stage. This trial still has some months to go. But a similar one overseas, using the same compound, CBD, is showing great promise for children with Drave syndrome. And they showed a median reduction of seizures of 40%, convulsive seizures, in the children compared with 9% in placebo, of placebo cases. So that is the first real evidence we have that it works. And that's fantastic. It is important to note that 40% is about the same as some of our anti-epileptic therapies as well. So it's not better, but it's not worse. And it's going to be great to have it to add to the range of drugs we can give our patients. It's possible this CBD drug for epilepsy will be available, in the US at least, in 2018. Back here in Australia, a surprising application for cannabis is being investigated. Although there have been no human trials, there are anecdotal reports of relatives treating Alzheimer's patients with cannabis and it having great effect. They were more alert, they could recognise their parents again, they started playing the piano again, which they hadn't done in years. These are obviously only case reports, but they are promising and they, in my opinion, justify that we continue with research in this area. Now, the researchers here don't think it's the whole plant that might do the trick. Rather, they think it's that key ingredient again, CBD. And they found some really interesting results with mice. We are one of the first groups in the world who worked with live mice. These mice have been genetically modified. This means over time they develop an Alzheimer's disease-like phenotype, which means they also develop cognitive deficits. The mice are treated either with a control substance or with CBD. They then undergo a variety of cognitive tests. So what's going on in this test? So this test is what we call a G-spot test. It tests spatial memory in animals. A hungry mouse learns over time that the same well contains a food reward. So it's exploring the mice it also looks at the external cues. That's those these are triangles, these, crosses. These triangles, crosses, these uh, geometric figures. And it just tries to work out where the food reward might be. The test is repeated over a number of days. Animals with a cognitive deficit can't find or can't remember this food reward very well, and therefore it takes them longer to find this food reward. The effect on the CBD-treated mice was striking. We found that both preventative and also in a remedial setup, CBD can prevent the onset of the cognitive symptoms and can also reverse cognitive symptoms once they have developed in these mice. Despite the strong findings, the team needs to do further work with mice before any clinical trials can start. But here at St Vincent's in Sydney, a very real-world trial of cannabis is taking place. Another one of the potential uses for medical cannabis is helping patients in palliative care, specifically to help them with pain reduction and to increase their appetites. Now, a particular cannabinoid thought to be involved in this is THC, and Australia's about to start one of the largest clinical trials in the world with terminally ill cancer patients. Good, yes, it is around 2017. Really? So you're spot on. Yes, you are. Okay. That's very good. 82-year-old Ruth Candell has terminal colon cancer and is a potential trial candidate. It makes you forget and makes you feel like you have a bit of energy or you feel you can do things, even though you 
the body may not be ready to do that. So I would like to invite you to be part of this trial. I can provide you with lots of information about the trial. I think the hardest part is uh, being in hospital for about eight days. I'm already there. (laughs) Yes, you are. A lot of patients tell me cannabis helps them forget. Forget they're in bad pain, make them feel better. But as a doctor, Richard Chai needs evidence-based guidelines before he can recommend it. I need to understand what is in the medicinal cannabis, how much THC, CBD. I need to know what it will do, what it won't do. I need to know its side effects. I need to know what dose I can prescribe. This trial is using raw cannabis that's high in THC and imported from the Netherlands. This is the device we'll be using. It's called the Mini Vape. It'll be delivered through a vaporizer, which heats the cannabis to around 200 degrees. This is where the cannabis will be put into. So it's a little mesh thimble. And so it's, it's just the crushed leaf. It's just the crushed leaf and flower that we want yeah. to put in here. 200. To monitor cannabis levels, yes. the participants need to have blood taken regularly. Can I be very honest? Please do. I think it's an excellent idea. I have an issue with the blood test. Yes. That's my problem. Okay. Very hard to get my veins. That is the only reason I would reject it. Otherwise, I'm a great believer hmm. in new ideas because if you don't have a new idea, you stagnate. Yeah. And actually, if you don't, you're going backwards. Unfortunately, there are plenty of other potential candidates, so the trial, no doubt, will soon be underway. Do you know the word scaredy cat? Yes. That's where I'm coming from. That's fine. (laughs) The results of the clinical trials won't be known for some time, but for those dealing with currently untreatable conditions, they hold great promise. That's why I'm such a big supporter of medicinal cannabis because I, I want children to have access to this from a very young age so they don't lose the skills like my son did because once the damage is done, it's permanent. I think trials are incredibly important because it could be that magic bullet for that child that could stop their seizures. And if you can stop their seizures, you can help their development. And if you can help their development, you can improve their long-term outcome, which is a life changer. Next time on Catalyst, with summer on our doorstep and the odd barbecue or bushwalk planned, we thought it was timely to revisit our story about the link between tick bites and meat allergies. And crowdfunding helps save the endangered swift parrot. Your couple of bucks that you threw to our random internet campaign has literally bred baby parrots this year. It's been amazing. For more information on tonight's stories, go to our website.